Paul's letter to the Colossians, page 250 in the Good News Bible. And we're going to read three verses this morning only. They're so full of truth. Again, our problem is time, but let's just look at these three verses. Verses 21 to 23 of Colossians chapter 1. At one time, you were far away from God and were his enemies because of the evil things you did and thought. But now, by means of the physical death of his Son, God has made you his friends in order to bring you holy, pure, and faultless into his presence. You must, of course, continue faithful on a firm and sure foundation and must not allow yourselves to be shaken from the hope which you gained when you heard the gospel. It is of this gospel that I, Paul, became a servant. This gospel which has been preached to everybody in the world. Way back in the year 1954, it was my privilege to be taken round the Vickers Aircraft Cap Factory in Weybridge. And my guide took me first into the drawing office where the plans were drawn up for bombers and bombs and many other things. One of the offices was where Sir Barnes Wallace, as he is now, designed those bouncing bombs which broke the dams in the Ruhr Valley. And I was shown the drawings of what was then being built, the Vickers Valiant Bomber. And then, having seen the drawings and the plans, I was taken down to the shop floor into those vast hangars in which the bombers were being built. And I was talking to various people who were building these aircraft and finally came to a man who was in charge of a large oil pressure press, which was turning a flat sheet of aluminium into a rather unusual shape. And all day long he was taking a sheet of aluminium, popping it in, pulling a lever, the press came down, the oil pressed up through its rubber pad and formed the aluminium into the mold, and then he lifted it out. And I chatted to this man and I said, now, I've been up in the drawing office, I've seen the drawings of the whole plane that you're building, I've said, what part is this that you're making? Where does it fit into the whole aircraft? And he looked at me in blank amazement, as if this was a very silly question to ask. And he said, I don't know. I said, but aren't you interested? You're helping to make the Vickers Valiant Bomber. Aren't you interested in where this bit fits in? He said, not the slightest. And there he was all day and every, every day just doing this thing and pulling out the piece of aluminum and never once asking how his contribution fitted into the whole, never asking whether he was doing anything significant. It reminded me of three people uh, in the Middle Ages who were working away with some stone and first one was asked, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm making one pound a week. And the second was asked, what are you doing? He said, I'm shaping a block of stone. And the third one was asked, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. You got the message? Now, in verses 15 to 20 of Colossians 1, I took you into the planning department, into the drawing office of the universe, and we saw there God's incredible plan for the entire universe. And you got a very breathtaking panorama of what God intends to do, not only with planet Earth, but with the entire universe. He intends to get it back to Christ. He intends there to be a new universe in which Christ has the central place, the first place, and all other things in him take their proper place. That is God's gigantic plan. It's breathtaking. And I think last Sunday morning you felt something of that. But now in verses 21 to 23, I've brought you down to the shop floor. 
And we are going to say, do you fit into this big plan? Have you discovered your place in it? Or are you just going through your daily life without ever once asking, how do I fit in? You see, here's this universal plan, but within it there is an individual part, just your shape, in which you can fit, provided you discover what that is. And what is true of the universe is true of you as an individual. When Christ has the central place in the entire universe, everything else will take its proper place. And when Christ has the central and foremost place in my individual life, everything else, my family, my money, my leisure interests, my hobbies, everything else take their proper place. And I'm part of the total plan. Well, now that's why Paul, having said that God made all things through Christ, all things for Christ, and through Christ's incarnation as a man in the flesh, through his horrible bloody death on the cross, and through his glorious rising from the dead, he is bringing back all things to himself. That's the plan. He suddenly says, and you, and you are being brought into the same plan. It implies first that you were out of it, that you were a long way off, that you were far away from God, that you were not relating as you should. But it implies too that in bringing all things back to God, God is also seeking to bring you back and get you in your proper place with Christ at the center. Well, now that's introduced our study. And there are three things, there are three verses I read, and each of the verses takes a different aspect of this whole plan of bringing everything back to God, including you. The first verse speaks of the hostility in which you once were, and in which some of you this morning still are, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, you are in a state of hostility towards God. Peace has not yet been declared. No armistice has been reached. A state of hostility exists. You are at war. And this is the most important war and peace in the entire world. I can remember vividly sitting in church on September the 3rd, 1939, and the service began with Neville Chamberlain's words, and therefore we are in a state of war. And this first verse 21 says that was your state before Christ got into your life. You were in a state of hostility. That was your past state as Christians. The second verse says this, your future state is going to be a state of holiness. Your past was a state of hostility in which you were far away from God. Your future, the possible standard which you can reach, is a state of holiness in the very presence of God. The third verse, verse 23, looks at the bit in between and looks at the present stand you must take if the past state is to give way to the possible standard of the future. And that will focus in on the one word, hope, the hope of the gospel, provided you continue in hope. In other words, that's what you were, that's what you can be, this is what you must be. If you are going to pass from hostility to hope, to holiness, then it will only be by continuing in hope. And this is the message for this morning. Let's look then first at this state of hostility. One of the great delusions under which most men and women in our world live is that they are not against God. I've been speaking to some this week right outside the church and they've said to me, I don't want you to think I'm against God. I don't want you to think I don't believe in God. And in fact, according to George Gallup's latest poll, which is a worldwide poll, the vast majority of people in this world believe in God. 
Britain is the second lowest nation in the Gallup poll for belief in God. There's only one nation with more godless people in it than Britain, and that's Japan. All the other countries polled were above Britain, except for Japan. But even in Britain, the figure was 69% believe in God. In most other nations, it went way up to 93, 94%. So most people believe in God, but here is the fundamental statement. You were against God. You were enemies of God. You were in a state of hostility towards God. And that's something that takes a bit of realizing. Most people in this country would say, I'm not against God. I don't like church much, but I'm not against God. I would say my prayers from time to time. But the Bible states absolutely clearly that until you know Jesus Christ... There is a state of war declared between you and God. Whether you've heard about that or not, whether you realize it or not, there's a state of war. Now, why is there a state of war? There are two reasons. First of all, because we are basically evil people. And that's a word you probably never used of yourself until you came to Christ. It's a thing you never realize. Wicked, evil, these are words you apply to other people. You never apply them to yourselves. You say with a sort of mock modest nervous laugh, well, no one's perfect and I've tried to do my best. And you never say, I'm a wicked person. You never say, I'm an evil person. But in fact, that is what you are until you know Jesus Christ. See, the reason we never apply these words to ourselves is that we apply the wrong standards or we ask the wrong person. We ask ourselves, am I wicked, am I evil? And self will most quickly come back with the answer, no, of course you're not. You're as good as Mrs. Sonsa next door and probably a bit better. You're not wicked, you're not evil. It's those cannibals, it's those criminals you read about in the papers, they're the evil people. It's those people who let off bombs in Belfast, they're evil, they're wicked. And you'll hear people, if you hear the, the word used in ordinary conversation, wicked, I'll guarantee somebody is using it about somebody other than themselves. And they say, isn't it wicked the way so-and-so is doing this? Isn't it wicked the way the trade unions are demanding more? Isn't it wicked the way the employers are behaving? Isn't it wicked the way this MP has been found to be corrupt? Isn't it wicked? But you'll never hear anybody saying, aren't I wicked? And it's because they're asking themselves. Or if you ask society, they will give you the wrong answer also. You go around and ask your neighbors, am I an evil person? Am I a wicked person? See what they reply. If they tell you the truth, they'll say, well, I thought you were a bit more wicked than I was. But um, no, you're not really wicked. You've, you've got your rough spots and you've got your corners to be rubbed off. But you're not wicked. I wouldn't call you wicked now. Society has its standards of decency and wicked is anybody who isn't part of our society or our social group. But if you ask scripture, am I wicked, am I evil, you'll get a very different answer. Ask self, you're not wicked. Ask society, you're not wicked. Ask scripture and every page says you are an evil person. Paul here says you were evil in what you did and thought. And he doesn't say some of you. He says all of you were evil. All of you. That's a bold statement. He's only following Jesus. Jesus said to the crowds that came to hear him, if you then being evil can give good things to your children. Being evil. And our Lord took it as an assumption that everybody was evil. Well now how does scripture prove that? Well, there are a lot of lovely pictures in Scripture. Scripture is a straight edge by which you see how crooked you are. It is a plumb line by which you can see how upright you are. It is a measuring rod to see just how good you are. It is a mirror to see how dirty you are. And in fact, we're like a lot of chimney sweeps li living together. And we go around and we say to each other, are you dirty? And we look at each other and we say, no, we're all the same. Nobody's dirty. But you know, when you look into a mirror and you see yourself as you really are, this book is a mirror. 
If anybody thinks they're not wicked or evil, I challenge them to sit down with Matthew 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and read it with an honest mind and say, if you've got to measure up to that to be good, and if you're not up to that, you're evil, am I evil? And I'm afraid the Sermon on the Mount strips away all the excuses you make. It shows you God's standards and it's devastating. Are you poor in spirit? Are you pure in heart? Are you merciful? Are you a murderer? When Jesus said a murderer is not just someone who stabs somebody in the back, it's someone who can't suffer fools gladly. Are you an adulterer, which doesn't mean climbing into bed, but thinking about doing so? Is your word yes, meaning yes, and no, meaning no? If worry is wickedness, are you wicked? Because the Sermon on the Mount says worry is wicked. It's a libel on your heavenly Father. Are you glad when others know that you've given a contribution to something? Are you rather happy to pray in front of others or for them to know that you're fasting? You go through the Sermon on the Mount. It's devastating. A man who can say, I'm not wicked, after reading those three chapters, is a man who's blind. And a man who can't see himself as he really is. So stop asking self. Stop asking society. Just take up the scripture and say, am I an evil person? And the scripture says you were his enemies because of the evil things you did and thought. Because evil is not only what we do, it's what we are. Now the result of that is this. That because I am evil, I become an enemy of God. I declare war with him. I may give lip service to saying I'm not against God, but as soon as he tries to put me right, I'm his enemy. As soon as he tries to get close to me, I close up. As soon as anyone gets at me about my wickedness, then I'm on the defensive. I'm in a state of hostility. I'll tell you why. Because to a man who is evil in his deeds and thoughts, God is the almighty spoil sport. He is the troubler of my conscience. He's an uncomfortable person to live with. And if you want to live a prodigal life, the first thing you do is put as much distance between you and the Father as you can get. And so you were once far away from God. Not physically, because he's nearer to you than your own lungs breathing. But spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you tried to get him as far away from your thoughts and feelings as you could. Indeed, one of the marks that you're in a state of enmity towards God is that you take it out of his children. And if you want to find out if people are enemies of God, you try going to talk to them about him. You try sharing the gospel with them. You try telling them about Jesus. You try telling them about the sins that he can save them from and find out if they're not against God. It is patently obvious that if you're an evil person, then you can't be a friend of God's. And indeed, though you may say you believe in him, you don't. Though you may say you're not against him, as soon as you are challenged to get nearer to him and to become the sort of person he wants you to be, you're on the run. You want to get away from there. You want to get as far from God as you can. So you don't read his word. You don't join his people. You can't love him. You don't even like him. And he's the most lovely person there ever was. Now that is enmity against God. And that's the state you and I were in. That's where God found us. Not just neutral people with kindly feelings towards him. He found us as rebels with weapons in our hands. And he found us with this state of evil in our hearts and minds. And he found us with this attitude of enmity towards him. Don't come too near me, God. I don't want you too near. I'm happy as I am. I was enjoying myself till you started talking to me. Get away. I want to be in the far country. I can live my own life. I don't want too much religion. I'm not going to get involved in the Bible. And I don't want to be one of those Christian people. And so we react one of the proofs to me of the enmity against God that runs right through the human race is anti-Semitism. 
Why? In every society where Jews have lived, has anti-Semitism developed sooner or later? I'll tell you why. Because the human race are enemies of God. And this is God's people and reminds the world that God really does exist. And that's why anti-Semitism is one of the characteristics of the human race that is now appearing as an anti-Christianism. Why is it that some of the world powers are so anti-Christian? Because that reminds them of God and the human race is in a state of enmity against God. You cannot be an evil person and not be an enemy of God. You cannot be a friend of God unless you're a good person because he's a good person. And good and bad people don't make friends easily because they haven't enough in common to be friends. There's a state of tension. I've seen it happen in an RAF barrack room where the barrack room was perfectly happy because everybody was much the same. They shared the same faults. They had the same failings. They were all evil together in the biblical sense. And into that barrack room came one young man who was a good young man. What happened? Did he make friends? Did they all flock to him and say, lovely to have a good man among us? No. The tension built up almost immediately. The man was sent to Coventry. He was isolated. He was different. He didn't laugh at the things they laughed. His standards were so much higher that he couldn't make friends. And he was ostracized. I've seen that happen. It's the beginning of the process that leads to ultimate crucifixion. The world can cope with evil people. It cannot cope with a good person. Not a really good person. And it was Socrates who said, before Jesus was ever born, Socrates says, if ever a perfect man came into this world, he would be put to death. Socrates could see that. The world is in a state of enmity against a good God. It doesn't want to be reminded of God. God is too good. And so we are in a state of war. We've declared war on God and therefore on his people. Now that's where we were. We are people who have declared UDI against our creator. Now let's turn to the possible standard we can reach. Verse 22. Here is the incredible good news of Christianity. But now, but now, the situation is totally different if you are a Christian. But now, the whole situation has been reversed. But now something is possible that before you became a Christian was just utterly beyond the bounds of your wildest imagination. What has become possible? God has done something about that state of war. He's done something about the enmity and about the evil. What has he done? It's at this point that I want to ask the question, what is different between Christianity and all the other religions of the world? And here there is something quite profound. Every other religion I've studied, and I haven't studied all of them, but I've studied many of them, every other religion in the world recognizes that there is a great gulf between man and God, that man is far away from God. Every religion recognizes that, including Christianity. It is how the gulf is to be bridged that is the real issue. And every other religion I've studied says this, make yourself good and you can become a friend of God. Deal with the evil and then you can be his friend. Do this, that and the other and then he might look at you. That is the teaching of every religion including Judaism that I know. It is get right and then you can get related. It is make yourself good and then you can know God. And so Islam would say, make yourself good by giving alms, by praying so many times a day, by fasting during Ramadan, by making a pilgrimage to Mecca. And at the end of the road, after you've done all that, God might relate to you. And Judaism says, keep the Ten Commandments. Really work hard at them. Make yourself good. And somewhere at the end of the road, God might relate to you. And Buddhism says the same thing. I came across a fascinating story this week. The Buddhist version of the parable of the prodigal son. Do you know it? The boy, when he comes home, comes to his father and confesses his sin. So do you know what his father says to him in the Buddhist version? 
His father says you must now pay penance. And he puts him through a long course of penance to be good enough to get back into the family. What a difference that is. In fact, Buddha himself only achieved the right relationship with the forces behind the universe after over 500 reincarnations. Trying to be good enough. Trying to be good in order to get to God. That is the summary of every other religion in the world. I don't care what name it goes under. That's the way. And frankly to me, that's not good news, that's bad news. Have you ever tried to be good? You don't know how hard it is until you've tried. And many of us have never tried, so we think it's easy. You try to be good enough for God. I think of Martin Luther who tried so hard to be good enough for God, whipping his own body until he fell unconscious in the monastery cell floor. He tried so hard and he found he couldn't make it. I think of Saul of Tarsus who tried so hard as a Jewish, Jewish Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, tried so hard to be good enough to get through to God. And he never made it. I think of John Wesley as a student at Oxford, Offering for the Anglican ministry, offering to go as a missionary to the Red Indians in North America, getting up at four in the morning to pray for hours, starting a club called the Holy Club, which went out round the streets, dishing out medicines to the poor, giving away every penny they got, visiting the prisoner, trying to be good enough for God, and he never made it. You don't know how hard it is to be good until you try, and most of us never bother to try, so we think it's easy. And that's what every other religion tells you. You've got to be good if you're going to get to God. You've got to stop being evil if you're going to cease being an enemy. And now comes Christianity into that milestone of thought and comes with this clear gospel. But now God has made us his friends in order to make us good. Do you see the difference? It's total difference. It's chalk and cheese. And Christianity is just totally opposite to every other religion. Every other religion says, do this good thing and you'll get through to God someday. And Christianity says, God starts by getting through to you. He makes friends first and makes you fit afterwards. And that's great news to me. Because the other way, there's no hope. I can no more make myself good than lift myself by pulling on my shoelaces. But if God is willing to have me as a friend first and then to help me to be good, now that's a different story. That's good news. That's hope. There's hope of arriving in his presence holy if he'll do it that way round. There's no hope whatever. And I've spoken to Muslims And I find there's no real hope of getting to heaven. There's a wish there. There's no assurance. There's no knowledge that they're going there. There's just the vague wish that maybe at the last day they might just be good enough and scrape in. That's not good news. The good news is, but now God has made you his friends in order to make you good. And that's what we mean by the word grace. It's the other way around. Now, I want you to realize what an incredible statement it is. God has made you his friends. It is not only incredible, it's downright immoral. For a holy God to be a friend of sinners is downright immoral. And that's why when they wanted to insult the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, when he was here on earth, they insulted him by hanging a label round his neck, friend of sinners. How utterly immoral for a man to claim to be good and mix with people like that. If I, if I can convey it to you, it's as if we discovered that a high court judge in London was secretly having a friendship with a wanted criminal on the run. It's downright immoral, isn't it? It's enough to lose a man his position in our society. And yet this is the incredible thing that God, who is utterly good, says, I will make friends with my enemies who are evil. How can he do it? How is it possible? 
I'll tell you it's only possible in one way and that is if he deals with the evil first in another way than making me good if he settles the account if he pays the debts if he atones for the crimes that's the only way and that's why you get this vital phrase God has made us his friends through the physical death of his son in order to make us good do you see that without the cross for God to be a friend of mine would be downright immoral if of God it would be condoning the evil it would be overlooking the crime it would be immoral but God didn't do that God said I can be friends with you on one basis and on one alone that my son pays for your sin first and then it's moral for me to be your friend now that's the incredible gospel of Jesus and that's why the cross is at the heart of it and if Jesus had not died God couldn't be your friend God could never do anything other than stay far away from you and say you can come and talk to me when you're good enough but since Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins and paid the penalty God is prepared to say let's be friends let's get together and let me help you to be good the past is dealt with let's put the future right now the relationship first then the righteousness and I praise God that God is the kind of God who doesn't leave a job half done he's only begun a good work in me if you ask me are you saved I will say no I will say I'm being saved because I'm not fully saved yet the righteousness is to come holy pure blameless just as we will never use the words wicked and evil of ourselves these are three words you never hear used of people right when did you last overhear a conversation in the bus and someone said of someone else you know he's a really holy person or he's blameless or he's pure you never hear those words you see the world settles down for this gray area in between and everybody's gray it neither uses the black words like wicked and evil of itself nor dare it use the white words holy pure blameless if I, if I put those into one English word that will get across the meaning of the three words it is this perfect and the devil's lies are these nobody's perfect you can't change human nature hallelujah you can in God and so God's intention is this his plan his gospel is this I will become a friend of yours following the cross and I will make you perfect in order that you may see my face one thing is quite clear you can be a friend of God before you see his face you can be a friend of God without being holy but you'll not see his face without being holy there is a holiness without which no man will see the Lord and the final word in verse 22 is the word presence or in the Greek face to face God says I have made you my friend in order that I may make you fit to see me face to face and live with me and so the gospel is composed of two parts and we must always remember these two parts the first part of the good news is God is willing to make you a friend of his but the second part of it is just as important he is only willing to do that in order to make you fit to be his friend instead of asking for the fitness first so that the friendship may happen he offers the friendship first so that the fitness may happen and that is the gospel and there is only one this is the gospel so now we come to verse 23 if that process of friendship leading to fitness is to take place of the relationship that will make the righteousness possible if that is to happen there is a condition to be fulfilled it does not happen automatically 
If I step onto the Christian life, I have not stepped onto an escalator that will automatically take me through the process and produce me perfect at the end of the line. There is nothing automatic about the Christian life. There is nothing inevitable about being fully saved. There is a proviso, and it comes out clearly here. Paul says, it's even clearer in the Greek than here. You must, of course, continue, it says here. But the Greek says, provided that, provided that you continue, provided that you stay with it, provided that you go on, the idea that you can once believe and then you're saved forevermore is not the gospel. The gospel is that you've been made a friend of God in order to be made fit for God. And that will never happen unless you continue. That's the gospel. In other words, the gospel makes something possible, not inevitable. Now that's a point which may cause a great deal of debate in your mind. It's almost as if a boy who wants a degree in engineering is given a place in university. That won't make him an engineer, giving him the place. But it opens up the possibility to him. Are you with me? Just being converted won't make you perfect, but it opens up the possibility to being perfect. Because now it's possible on the basis of the friendship. And now you can begin the process. But it will not happen. God cannot and will not do it without your cooperation. There is a responsibility on your side to continue in the hope of the gospel so that the fitness may follow the friendship. And so we come to the third verse. The persistent stand we must take is on the ground of hope. On the ground of hope. You see, the real question is not whether we arrive in heaven, but how we arrive in heaven. In what state we are when we're called how far we've got in the process. The goal is not inevitable. I'm not now discussing the once saved, always saved issue because the very statement once saved is not a biblical statement. You are only being saved. You're not totally saved. You're not once saved. You've started being saved and salvation is a whole process. If I can put it this way, Jesus didn't come primarily to save you from hell and get you to heaven. He came, as his name indicates, to save you from your sins. That's the salvation that is the gospel. That is the hope that is aroused by the gospel. And so Paul says to the Colossians, you must continue faithful on a firm foundation and make sure you're not shaken off that foundation or the process of being made fit will grind to a halt. And you will not become fit and the friendship with God will not produce its fruit. And he was speaking in the Lysus Valley. He was writing to the Lysus Valley where earthquakes were common and where big buildings could be shaken off their foundations. And he was using language that they used frequently. They understood that the Christian life must remain on its foundation. If it's shaken off it, then the process stops. The progress does not continue. Now, how can you be shaken away from the gospel? I've told you what the gospel is. It is the relationship that makes the righteousness possible. It is the friendship that leads to the fitness for God. Now the shaking of the gospel is to be shaken from one or other of those two points. There are two travesties of Christianity. There are two distortions of the gospel in the world. I label them legalism and license. Legalism forgets the friendship. License forgets the fitness. Legalism forgets the relationship side. License forgets the righteousness side. And here are the two distortions of the gospel. And Paul was always fighting on two fronts to preserve the truth against these two distortions. The first distortion is legalism, in which you substitute rules and regulations for the friendship you have with God. And that is always happening among Christians if you're not careful. I remember one lady who came to our church six years ago, and many of you will know who I mean. And she became a Christian, was baptized. And then one day she came to me and she said, uh, I have a question to ask. She said, I am a bit worried about my job as to whether a Christian should be doing the job I'm in. 
And I said, what is your job? I haven't known. And this person said, I'm the proprietor of a betting shop. And uh, the person said, should I give this job up? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. And the person was so frustrated and said, you're the fifth person I've asked in the fellowship. And they've all said the same thing. Almost saying, why don't you Christians help someone who's got a problem? I said, no, I'm not going to tell you. I said, the Lord Jesus must tell you. I said, what did the others say? And the person said, exactly the same. I'm not going to tell you. The Lord Jesus must tell you. And so the person said, but how do I ask him? How does he tell me? I said, well, you take him into your betting shop this week, every day. You ask him to look over your shoulder while you make up the accounts. You ask him how he's feeling while you're taking that money from that man. You just share the business with him for a week and see what happens. Next Sunday, the person said to me as they came into church, it's been a disastrous week. <laughs> everything's gone wrong. It's the worst week for profit we've ever had, and just everything went wrong. The number of customers has been lower. So I said, what do you judge from that? The Lord's saying, get out. And they did. I say this to you, I praise God for a fellowship that didn't lay down rules and regulations, but said, get the relationship, get the friendship. I'm so glad none of you told that person to get out of it, and that you said, get the relationship. Do you see what I mean? And so we're always telling each other what we must eat and mustn't eat, and what we must drink and what we mustn't drink, and all the rest of it. And you know, Paul in chapter 2 says, don't allow yourselves to get into this rule and regulation kind of Christianity, to get into this legalism which, if you're not careful, subtly replaces the relationship with the idea that you've got to be good enough and that you're not good enough if you don't do this or if you do do that, you know? And that's not the gospel. The gospel is base your righteousness on the relationship, not on rules and regulations. Get the gospel right. And legalism is something that keeps creeping in. Having begun in the spirit, we continue in the flesh. Having begun by getting free of the law, we go back to it. And that's a distortion of the gospel. And you try to earn your, earn your right to be a Christian. And you try to make yourself worthy to be a Christian. And it only finishes up by producing self-righteousness, which is offensive to God. And self-righteousness produces pride which takes you right back to where you were before. Oh, what a good boy am I. Now, having said that, if legalism puts goodness first, I'm afraid license is goodness forgotten. And that's the other distortion. So easy, you see, for a gospel that says... <coughs> God first, then goodness, to be distorted into either goodness first or goodness forgotten. And goodness forgotten is license. It is to say, I'm saved, I am. I'm on my way to heaven. I've got a ticket to glory. It doesn't matter how I live. I've got a blank check to sin. I can sin because grace will then abound. I don't need to bother to try to be good now. I'm a Christian. I'm on my way to glory. I've got a passport to heaven. Everything's fine. Maybe I'm caricaturing. But isn't it interesting that Paul immediately fights on this front, having fought on the other, having told them, don't listen to rules and regulations, don't do this and don't do that. He then proceeds to say, don't do this and don't do that. And you say, Paul, you're inconsistent. No, he's not. Paul is saying, in Christ, there is no room for this and that and the other. We shall see that when we get to chapter 3. There are certain things that don't fit there's got to be the goodness following the relationship. There's got to be the righteousness within the relationship. But it's not rules and regulations, it's relationships. And those have got to be increasingly right. And so there is an obligation on Christians to be worthy of the friendship of God. There is an obligation on the part of Christians to make the effort to have that goodness that is now possible 
to be an athlete stripping himself of every handicap to run a race, to be a soldier taking away encumbrances that will not help in the warfare. And this is the very delicate balance that the gospel holds. It is not you must be good enough for God, nor is it now that you've been accepted by God you don't need to be good. It is God giving you his goodness as you cooperate to receive it. So Paul, fighting on both fronts, says the one thing that will hold you firm and keep you in the process of being saved is that you hold on to the hope of the gospel. What is that hope? I do not believe that the fundamental hope of the gospel is heaven. That can make Christians as materialistic as everybody around them except that they look for their good life in the next world rather than this one. But that's disguised materialism. The hope that the gospel arouses is this. And if the preaching of the gospel did not arouse this hope in your heart, it was not the gospel of Paul or the gospel of Jesus. The hope that is born in your heart when you hear the gospel of Jesus is this. There is a hope of my becoming good. That's the hope. That's why his name, Jesus, is tied up with that hope, not to save you from hell, but to save you from sins, to make you good, to make you fit to live in God's world and to see God face to face. That's the hope. And deep down in the human heart, that hope is there already. It is kindled by the gospel. I don't believe there's a man or a woman who doesn't hope that they might be able to live a good life. There's a desire deep down, a dream in all of us to be decent people. And the gospel brings that hope to life. It's the hope of being not only good or decent, but perfect. The hope of living faultlessly one day. Can you imagine yourself doing that? That's the hope that the gospel aroused. A certain kind of gospel preaching gives the impression that one act of faith and you escape hell and enter heaven. That is not gospel preaching. Gospel preaching is this. The Lord Jesus lays before you the hope of being a good man, a good woman, fit to be a friend of God's. That's the hope of our calling. That's the hope of the gospel. And you can soon tell whether a man or a woman has this hope. How? I'll tell you. Because everyone who has this hope in him does something about it. If you hope to be something someday, you seize every opportunity you can to take a step nearer to that hope. You do not wait for it. You get on with it. Why, Edward Heath, at the age of 14, told his father, I hope to be Prime Minister of England one day. So did he just sit and, and take a job as a dustman and just wait for that to happen? No. Every opportunity he got to take a step nearer to that hope he took, he grasped. If a man hopes to be a great musician, he seizes every opportunity he can to play and to practice, does he not? And if you really have a hope of being perfect, you snatch every chance you can of getting a step nearer to that goal. Is that not true? And so John puts it in his letter. He says, we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah for that. But is that the hope? No. The hope is the next little bit, if it's real, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. I'm not going to get involved in a debate on sinless perfection this morning. I'm unhappy when someone takes one of two extreme views. There are some who say you can reach a state of sinless perfection in a moment after which you'll never sin again, even in this world. I don't believe that's true. I believe that you can live a moment-by-moment -moment perfection, but it's not a once-and-for-all thing. It's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. At this moment, you can make a perfect response to the situation and to the Lord, but that doesn't guarantee you'll make a perfect response tomorrow. At the other extreme are those who say you can never be perfect in this life,
And they have a kind of donkey and carrot ethic for the Christian. And the donkey must keep on pressing after the carrot with no hope of ever getting there. Look, where did Jesus live the perfect life? In heaven or on earth? And where did he tell us to live the perfect life? In heaven or on earth? When he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Did he mean when you get to heaven? No, he says, let's get on with it now. If you've got a hope of living perfectly in heaven before his face, grab it now. Every opportunity you can, grab it now. This is the sign that you really hope this and that it's not wishful thinking. A man who says, I'm going to wait till heaven, till I get to heaven before I'm perfect, is a man who's lost his hope. He may say it, but he doesn't hope it. But if he hopes to live in heaven that way, he will grab every chance he can on earth to live that way now. That's what hope does to you. It affects your present. It affects what you do now. So I conclude. This gospel, said Paul, this gospel is the gospel that I am a minister of. And I think of this man who wrote this letter on the Damascus Road, having tried to be good enough for God, having slaved away for years to keep the commandments, having tried so hard to be good enough and knowing in his heart that he didn't know God, that he hadn't got through to God, and that he wasn't good enough for God, this man met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said, When you're good enough, I'm going to use you, Paul. No, he didn't say that. He just said, Paul, I'm going to use you. We're friends. And Paul began the great work that he was to do. And in a moment, his religion was turned upside down. In a moment, he got it the other way up, right way up. In a moment, he saw that the friendship comes first and that then the goodness comes second. That you start getting related and then you've got into the process of becoming righteous. And his whole religion became good news. As a Jew, his religion was bad news. It was such bad news that it produced miserable people who just never got there. Who were trying so hard to be good enough for God and just couldn't make it. And now he went everywhere preaching the good news. God has made you friends through the physical death of his son on the cross in order to present you blameless in his presence. That's the good news. Now it's possible. Now God is on your side. He's not over the gulf. He's not an enemy. There's not a state of hostility. He's on your side fighting with you against a common enemy. And he's going to get you there. And if you stay with this hope, this hope, this certainty that you're going to be perfect, then you'll grab every bit of that perfection you can have every time God offers you a bit. You will live that way. You will live as someone who's quite sure you're going to be perfect. And you'll press on and leave the things that are behind and stretch forward towards the goal. And you'll run the race looking to Jesus. Paul says, this gospel is the gospel which I preach. This gospel and no other is the good news. This is Christianity. And then finally, lest they think that he's a bit odd, that this is not real religion. As many people did. For to most people, religion is doing your best. To those who would think that Paul was preaching a gospel all of his own, he says again, this gospel is not only the gospel I preach. This gospel is preached to everybody in the world. This gospel. This then is Christianity. It is not indifferent to being good. But it does not say you've got to be good. It's a paradox which must be held against these two distortions. On the one hand, those who say you've got to make yourself good to get there. And on the other, those who say it doesn't matter whether you're good or not. In between is the gospel. He has made you his friends already in order that he may make you good enough to look him in the face. That's the gospel. And if you continue in the hope of being good enough, then you will go on being saved. This gospel is the gospel that was preached by a young lady, a Sunday school teacher in Farnborough many years ago in the parish church Sunday school. And if you've been to Farnborough, you've seen the parish church standing on a green hill there. And one day this Sunday school teacher said to the class, 
let me tell you what it's all about. And she told them the story of the cross and she said, you know that Farnborough Parish Church stands on a green hill? Well, she said, there is a green hill far away outside a city wall. And as she said it, she thought that's poetic. So she thought, I'll continue. Where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. And the hymn came. And then she put all of Christianity in one verse. And I'm going to recite that verse and I'm going to recite it wrongly to show you the distortion of the gospel that many people have got, which is not this gospel. He died that we might be forgiven, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. Did you notice what was missing? That's not Christianity. It's what many think it is, but it's not. This gospel says he died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good. That's what the gospel is, that we might go at last to heaven. It's not forgiveness straight to heaven. It's forgiveness making it possible to be made good, to go to heaven, and all of it by his precious blood. That's the only gospel I know. There is no other. This is Christianity. This is the good news. We were enemies of God. We disliked him intensely when we were brought near to him. So we stayed far away from him because we were evil in deed and thought. But now God jumped the gulf and came across to our side and said, let's be friends. But God, you shouldn't be friends with me. I'm a bad person and you're a good holy God. And God says, but my son has settled the account. He has died on the cross and now it's possible for me to treat you as friends without being immoral myself. And now I'm on your side and I'm going to make you good. And if you stay with this hope of being perfect and if you are not shaken in that hope and constantly live for it and grab every bit of it you can, then I will present you faultless face to face in my presence. I prayed that God would help me this morning to make the gospel utterly clear. And I pray that if I haven't, that the Holy Spirit of truth will make it clear for you. Let's pray. Good God, thank you for being willing to be friends with bad people. Thank you for accepting us as we are. But thank you, too, that you have no intention of leaving us as we are. That you want good people in heaven. And that you're prepared to help us to be good. Oh, God, that's good news. And so we pray, deliver us from distortions of the gospel. Deliver us from forgetting either of those two things. And bring us at last into your presence, perfect people, without fault, pure, holy, clean, good. And thank you, Lord, for making it possible through Jesus, what it cost you. Now, Lord, we would in a moment of silence remember the blood that he shed while we were still enemies. Oh, what love. So, Lord, teach us what it is to live up to the hope of our calling. For your name's sake. Amen.